show hand show. Hi everyone and welcome to our very first Spooky Saturday. Like you guys requested, I'm wearing the Morticia wig. This will only be for Spooky Saturdays. So hopefully everybody recognizes me without my real hair, <laughs> but I don't know, I feel like it's kind of a slight. Also Dante is here for moral support. In today's video, we're gonna be focusing on two individuals. Firstly, our charismatic leader, Keith Raniere. And secondly, his right-hand man, or in this case, woman, Allison Mack. Allison Mack is out on bail after facing a judge in Brooklyn. Prosecutors say she recruited women into a sex trafficking sorority disguised as a women's empowerment group. Now, if that second name sounds especially familiar to you, it's likely because you grew up watching The CW in the early 2000s. Allison Mack was actually an actress before she got involved with this cult. She was most notably in Smallville, and she was the female lead in that show as well. Her character's name was Chloe Sullivan. But before that, she was actually already pretty established. She started acting at a very young age and she was actually a starring role in the Disney Channel original, Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves. It is the third film in the Honey, We Shrunk the Kids film franchise. Allison Mack's early life is interesting because she was successful at a young age, but relatively unimportant in terms of the cult. Other than being a child star, there's not really any red flags in Alison Mack's early life that we're aware of. She was born in Germany in the 1980s because her father was a touring opera singer. But even though she is American, she was born while her father was on tour. When the tour concluded, they came back stateside, and this is when she started her first few acting endeavors, and she very quickly gained momentum. And when she had just turned 18, she finally got her big break with Smallville. It was a huge turning point in her career, and by the end of her involvement in the series, she was actually making six figures an episode, and she was in the vast majority of the episodes. Not only that, when the show would roll its introductory credits, she was listed alongside Tom Welling, who obviously played Superman. This show was a smash hit. It originally started out on WB before switching to the CW, which wasn't created yet when the show first began running. And it was alongside these crazy juggernaut shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And it was one of the earliest superhero live action shows that we saw. And with how intense the superhero fandom is, it naturally gained a lot of momentum very, very quickly. And Allison was actually a fan favorite. It turns out that she was a network favorite as well because the execs loved her. She had an incredible working relationship with them. They were putting her in more and more episodes, but the filming took place in Canada. This is actually where they film all of the CW shows. But the problem with this is CW shows tend to have incredibly young actors, which isn't like problematic in and of itself. But she was 18 when the show first started. She's in Canada for nine months out of the year and they only get a few months off. So a lot of CW actors end up quitting before the show's run times end because they don't wanna be stuck in one specific type of role. They can't really take on other greater projects when they only have like two months off. And so even though the pay is really good, if you're trying to build a career where you're a dynamic actor and you wanna have this great portfolio, it can actually be pretty limiting. When Allison Mack came to the production and she said, hey, listen, I wanna take a step back from my role. I want you guys to basically cut my character out of the script. They had all assumed, even though they had this great relationship with her and they didn't want to see her go, that it was likely because she wanted to be able to take on other projects. But the reality was so much worse. The real reason why Allison wanted to take a step back from Smallville, despite the fact that they were setting up her character to be a super integral part of the finale of the show, was because it was really cutting into her time at the cult. Halfway through filming Smallville in 2006, Allison Mack's co-star, Chris Cook, would introduce her to somebody who would change her life. Cook told Mack that she was a part of this program called the Executive Success Program, that it helped people not just in entertainment, but in all industries who really wanted to retool themselves, put their best foot forward, and make a name for themselves. She explained how it was this great opportunity for working women and how it was also really beneficial for your mental health. Allison Mack, being young, being away from her family, she was going through a lot. Most young people, they're trying to carve out a sense of identity. And even though on paper, she's this actress who's a fan favorite, she's really well liked at work, she's making a lot of money, she has a really cute dog, she has a really nice house, she still felt really isolated. She felt insecure about her relationship status. 
she felt like she wasn't sure who she was and she wasn't sure if she liked who she was and even though she was achieving all these great things it just didn't feel like enough it didn't feel like she was doing what she wanted to be doing so when cook was telling her about this program she thought you know what actually that might really help me. That might be something that I should go to. Yeah, I'm interested, let's go. But the executive success program was not what it initially seemed. And it actually went by another name as well. A name that would become infamous. That name being Nexium. Going to this meeting with Christina would prove to be the worst decision that Mac had ever made in her entire life. You see, Nexium was founded by this man named Keith Ranieri. He's our charismatic leader, and Keith is just a bundle of red flags straight out of the gate. He made claims that he was the smartest man alive. He made claims that he was being watched by the FBI because he was considered a national risk due to how intelligent he was. He also claimed that he could control the weather. And I know what you're thinking. Every time I talk about cults with anybody, not just on video, but in my personal life as well, People always have this visceral reaction of like, how dumb do you have to be to fall for this? And the thing is, if you're somebody who has that immediate reaction, you are actually at a higher risk to be indoctrinated by a cult. The thing is, cults almost always target people who are highly successful, either academically or they have some sort of clout attached to them. And that's not to say that everybody who does well in school is automatically intelligent. But what I'm saying is, People who consider themselves to be smart, people who are smart, they tend to be more likely to fall victim to this sort of thing because they just don't see it happening to them. So they don't see the red flags often because it just doesn't seem like something that would happen to somebody who's not an idiot. And that is how you end up falling victim to cults. Because of course, Keith doesn't come out of the gate being like, oh, you see that cloud there? Made that. No. What he does is he looks for people who have a lot of money, have a lot of clout, but also have a lot of sadness, have attachment issues, feel like they're just kind of floating, don't really have a sense of community, feel socially isolated. And so what he does is he leads with love. That's how people get tricked into shit like this. They're being told, you know, this is a safe space. We want you to be the best version of yourself. If you don't want to be here, you know, leave. Like, that's totally fine. They don't put these obvious restrictions on you right out of the gate. It's like being a lobster in a pot. They slowly simmer to a boil. And by the time you're boiling, you're like, I can't get out of this pot anymore. I'm too far gone. I've also noticed that organizations like this, they follow this sort of new age motif, you could say. It's this belief system that you're in charge of your reality. That's what they preach. You're in charge of your reality, your perception's your reality. So your reality is what you make it. And that sounds very hopeful on paper, but it's actually a very problematic concept because what that ends up being is it's a way to groom people. And you can groom adults, by the way. It's not just children. It's different when you're grooming adults, but cults always groom people who join them. You're not just like gun ho usually once you see all the red flags. You have to be groomed into it. This new age thinking of your perceptions, your reality, is hammered into these people slowly but surely. And then it starts out with like, when something bad happens, give yourself 24 hours to process it and then get back on that horse. You can do this. You're so resilient. You're better than you think you are. You can do it. It starts out like that. And then it slowly shifts over to the realm of, don't let yourself be a victim. You're only a victim if you identify as a victim. Chant with me, I am not a victim. I am not a victim. And it seems like this like mantra of like, yeah, I can get out there and do it. When really you're, you're just tricking people into victim blaming themselves. Because Scientology does this as well. It's this belief that, you can only be a victim if you decide that you're a victim. So even if you've been legitimately victimized by any normal standard, in these groups, it doesn't work like that. You're only victimized if you agree to it. You can only be victimized if you consent to the fact that you're a victim. So somebody could stab you, somebody could assault you, somebody could R-word you, 
And you're still not a victim unless you think you're a victim. And why would you think you're a victim when you don't have to think you're a victim? Just decide that it's fine. Duh. Otherwise, you just want to be miserable. That's what they do to people. So slowly after that concept is really hammered into you, you normalize these things that should not be normalized because they're not normal. And that's how these very intelligent people end up being indoctrinated. And when you get out of a cult, if you escape a cult, there's this long harrowing process of like having to accept the fact that like you fell for somebody who's essentially like a con man or con woman, you know? And there's all this shame around it. So I just want to say a quick disclaimer, like before you type out like these people are idiots, just remember like it's a whole second wave of trauma that they have to reconcile with the fact that they've been tricked. It's like when you get cheated on and like someone's been lying to you for a long time and then you go and talk to your friends about it and you're just like, God, I'm just like so stupid. You're not stupid for seeing the best in somebody. That's actually a good trait a lot of the time. Unfortunately, there's a lot of good traits that can be taken advantage of by bad people though. Let's get into the backstory of Keith Ranieri really quick. Keith, unlike Allison Mack, his early life is full of red flags. It is actually kind of nothing but red flags. So with Allison, a lot of people who knew her or know her now see what ends up happening with her and they can't believe it. They're just like, whoa, this is such like a vast shift from the person that I thought I knew. Whereas people who knew Keith, he's just kind of pretty Keith with all of this. Like this is very him, what he's done. He's kind of always sucked. Since a very young age, Keith was observed as displaying tendencies that could be aligned with compulsive lying. I'm not like a psychologist. I don't want to armchair psychologist him, but he has a problem with lying to put it simply. He also has a problem with an inflated sense of self. And while it's good to be confident in yourself, there is a line where it gets into crazy town. Keith would often boast about how he is the smartest man on earth, like I said, right? Meanwhile, when he was in college, he actually ended up being on academic probation and then getting kicked out of the school because his grades were just so terrible because he's a bad student. Now, I myself, I don't do very well in a super rigid academic environment. I'm a much better independent learner. so. If your grades aren't great, that's not a reflection on your intelligence necessarily. But when you're somebody who boasts to the fact that like you could do anything and be the best at it out of everyone who's doing it, clearly not Keith. After Keith gets kicked out of college basically because his grades were bad, he joins this pyramid scheme, Amway, as a contributor, which basically just means like he has to pay to get in. He's not very high in the pyramid and he's just got to get other people to buy it. It's like your classic. MLM random person from high school messages you on Facebook and it's like, hey, you could make so much money selling these shoes. You just have to buy 5,000 of them up front. So he's looking around at this pyramid scheme and he's like, mm, I'm actually feeling inspired. It's got a certain je ne sais quoi. So he creates his own pyramid scheme and it's called Consumers Blonde. Now, at this time, Keith gets a new girlfriend. I would say good for Keith, except for the fact that he's 26 and his new girlfriend is a 15 year old girl. So Keith is a And if you thought like, wow, that's pretty bad. Surely it can't get worse. Eh, it does because then he convinces her to convince her friend who was also 15 that she should also date him. So he has two 15 year old girlfriends add them together and they're almost the same age as Keith. From what I can tell, these girls are Keith's earliest victims, at least his earliest public victims. And obviously all minors involved, they're gonna be, they're gonna remain anonymous. But over the course of the next decade, there would be six other girls who at least come forward. So, you know, multiply that by three because usually it's just one in three are willing to report. There would be six other girls who would come forward and blow the whistle on the fact that Keith, who was very much so an adult, was engaging in inappropriate behavior. I mean that like in baseball terms, home run, okay? Gotta get around the YouTube algorithm. But there would be six girls who would come forward and accuse Keith of those activities and they would all be within the age range of 12 to 16. But before I get ahead of myself, let's get back to consumers beyond. Keith, was running his pyramid scheme. He was feeling pretty good about it. And then suddenly in 1993, it's getting investigated. He's like, what? 
it's a problem for me to run a pyramid scheme and the federal government is like, yes. And he was being investigated in 25 states for reference. So obviously the feds shut his bull down. Not one to stay down for too long. Keith gets back on the pyramid scheme horse. He decides that he's just gonna start another pyramid scheme and he's just gonna keep doing this until he can't do it no more. So his next pyramid scheme centers around vitamins. At this point, he starts dating somebody else. I tried to confirm the age of his new girlfriend, couldn't find anything about it, but this is how he gets introduced to a very key player in this whole story. That player being a woman known by the name of Nancy Solzman. Now, Nancy was actually a certified clinical psychologist. From what I could tell, she only practiced for about a year, but I've seen varied reports on that, so she may have practiced for longer, Hard to know, just gonna throw that out there. Nancy gets introduced to Keith because Keith's girlfriend at the time reaches out to Nancy knowing what her job is and she's like, hey, my boyfriend has a real issue with lying and an inflated sense of self and it's causing a lot of problems in our relationship. He seems to think that he walks on water. It, it's, it's actually insane and that everyone is below him and I really wanna make it work for some reason, I don't know. I really wanna make it work, so I'm hoping that you can help me. Just on her description alone, they go back and forth for a little while and Nancy is like, honestly, I have to assess him in person to confirm I'm not like diagnosing him yet. Also, I think this part is probably like a little immoral from like a clinical psychologist perspective. It seems pretty unprofessional, but like, I don't know. She's like, I have to meet with him, but it sounds like you're describing somebody who has antisocial personality disorder, also known as psychopathy. And so she's like, I would like to meet Keith. She meets Keith. They have a few sessions. And then she goes to Keith's girlfriend who like brought this to her attention in the first place. And she's like, no, you just don't understand Keith. He's actually a very special person. Nancy, your whole job is to like know what red flags are. How are you getting got by, by Keith? Oh my God. So in 1998, Keith and Nancy create another pyramid scheme together, this one being Nexium. With Nancy by his side, Keith can brand this as a self-help program, where he's like, you have to buy these courses, I'll make you into your best version of yourself, you'll be confident, you'll excel in your love life, your work life, financially, everything. All you need to do is listen to me and listen to Nancy. And these courses were incredibly expensive, insanely expensive. But not only that, Keith and Nancy just immediately got weird with it. They established a hierarchy right out of the gate, of course, because it's a pyramid scheme. So gotta have that pyramid shape going. But beyond that, they did a classic, classic cult red flag. If you meet anybody who's in charge of a program who does this, just know, you might be in a cult. The members of Nexium are instructed to only refer to Keith as Vanguard, like from the video game, and only refer to Nancy as Prefect. So you have to be like, yes, Prefect, thank you, Prefect, yes, Vanguard, thank you, Vanguard. And they're saying that this is like a show of respect. Why you would need to show respect in what is essentially supposed to be like a self-help business program I don't know, but you know, whatever. Keith and Nancy start touting this program as being more valuable than an MBA. Something Keith would know nothing about, but whatever. Uh, Nancy got her degrees, so I guess that legitimized things from an outside perspective a little bit more, but these programs, like I said, were incredibly expensive. They implemented these sashes, sort of like when you're in karate um, and you get like a different color belt for every level. They basically did that via sash so that you would want to continue taking the courses because people could visually ascertain how much you have invested in this program. There was a strong emphasis on like, the more you invest and take as many courses as possible, the higher ranking you are in this program. So from an egotistical standpoint alone, people wanted more of these sashes. And beyond that, they also created this strange sense of false distance between Nancy and Keith, or sorry, Vanguard and Prefect, where you would have to take a 16 week course and invest $100,000 
before you were able to meet Keith or Nancy. This detail is especially important because when potential VIP recruits would come to these courses, those rules suddenly magically didn't apply. And it's because Keith and Nancy understood the importance of affiliate marketing. This is where Keith and Nancy and Allison Mack finally cross paths in this story. Allison comes with Christina to a meeting. She takes two courses. After the second course, all of the pre-existing members are like, oh my gosh, you have to meet Vanguard. You have to meet Prefect. They're telling their higher ups to tell their higher ups to tell their higher ups that everybody's got to meet Allison Mack because she gets it. And there is this really, I'll, I'll see if I can put it in this video. There is this really, there is this really just kind of retrospectively sad clip of when Allison and Keith meet for the first time, you can see that she is mentally and emotionally going through something at that phase in her life. And she's just really wanting for a sense of community. And he's just there like a shark smelling blood in the water. You can just see him looking at her, licking his chops, right Dante, ready to attack. What if artistic endeavors were really bogus? What if? Mm. What if art was just an excuse for those who couldn't build? And it is sometimes. The most exciting that you've ever felt. It's yours to have all the time. Mm. Independent of art. Mm -hmm. The bad news is you sort of have to divorce yourself from the thought that comes from the art. Mm -hmm. If you feel that art is necessary for that, that's almost a self-condemnation. Why is this an option? Hi. <laughs> it's okay. She comes in close. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, I should be used to this. It's what I do for the living. Um, because it's pointing at something I've never thought about. And a part of me is kind of freaked out about accepting this. I'm used to that self condemnation. <laughs> I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> if I let go of that belief mm -hmm. that it's not the art that's giving me this feeling, it's me that's giving me this feeling, then I have to trust that I will be capable of giving myself that feeling. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily trust that right now. Mm -hmm. And so that's scary because I want that feeling. <laughs> So Allison Mack, she's getting all this positive reinforcement. She starts quickly climbing the ranks in the program and she is getting fawned over essentially. People are like, wow, she's doing incredible work. There's all these interviews of her online. She has a YouTube channel where she's talking about the work that they're doing. And she's like, I feel like I'm being called to a higher purpose. You know, I felt really insecure about the fact that I didn't have a boyfriend and blah, blah, blah. And then I realized I was really just looking for an experience within myself. And once I found that experience within myself, I felt so much more whole. Again, a brief aside, the thing with Colts is, a lot of the time in the introductory stages of recruitment, they actually are teaching genuinely good things. They actually are giving you positive experiences. They actually are helping you confront your traumas, but it's because they need to uncover what those traumas are. They have to figure out what your mental and emotional triggers are and they have to get you to talk about it so that you can bond over these traumas. And then later, when they reenact that trauma upon you, they then will do something to you that they know is gonna traumatize you, turn around and act like they're your soft, your soft place to land, which is a classic narcissistic technique. And it's so that you will be trauma bonded to them. You can't be trauma bonded to them if they don't know the best way to get at you though. So that's why they have to do this in the recruitment stage. Another thing that organizations like this love to do is they love to collect collateral. Nexus does this, Scientology does this, plenty of cults have done this. Collateral is where you go in and you basically confess your sins. You tell them all the worst things you've ever done. If you have evidence of it, you give it to them. If you have nude photos of yourself, you give it to them. 
Sometimes I'll even make you participate in like humiliation rituals and stuff, like videotaping you doing something terrible that is like a cancelable offense so that they had that over you. Sometimes if you haven't really done anything that's that bad, they'll make you get on camera and lie, confess to something you haven't done, or confess to something someone you really care about hasn't done. Like there were people from Nexus who some of their collateral was them lying on camera saying that their husband would beat their kids, for example. So if that footage were to ever come out, they would be, CPS would immediately be involved, their children would be taken away, you know? So a lot of the collateral is things like that. It's also usually a lot of money. Various groups have different ways of collecting this collateral. With Scientology, because they have so many celebrity members, they'll be like, oh, it's so that we can protect you from getting canceled. We can, we know everything, all the skeletons in your closet so that we can look out for you in advance. That's also something a lot of PR teams do, or like if you're running for president, you've got to tell your team like the worst things you've ever, you've ever done so that they can plan around it, plan accordingly. It's very easy because there are versions of this in other places that aren't predatory places. It's very easy to justify why this information would even be relevant if you've already built up that trust and that ethos with somebody. They're thinking, this person's not gonna hurt me, they're just looking out for me, even though that's not true. They're collecting the collateral so that you can either A, not leave the cult, or B, if you do leave the cult, you can't blow the whistle on the cult without fear of the whistle being blown on you. So Allison Mack, she's killing it in this cult. She's climbing the ranks. Keith, he loves all the work that she's doing. He's schmoozing her. He's telling her she's amazing, da da da, everything that she wants to hear. And he's sort of made her like the celebrity face of this group. They had other celebrities in it, but he was like, you're my end to entertainment. You're the person that I need to legitimize us. So he starts having her go out and he's like, hey, I want you to use your network. I need you to use your network. Try and get other people involved in this. Show them how amazing it is, the incredible work that we're doing. So like on her Twitter, for example, like you can see that like she tweeted like all the time at Kelly Clarkson and Emma Watson being like, we're doing amazing work here for women, like you need to join, da, da, da. And luckily Kelly Clarkson and Emma Watson um, never responded, they just, <laughs> they just ignored it. But Keith and Nancy, they had caught these, these celebrity like affiliation bug, basically, where they realized like, we need this to take this group to another level. It's a pyramid scheme. They're making money directly off of this group and they're making the most money out of everybody. So they gotta get this group as big as they can realistically get it. They start reaching out to people who have political power. They start reaching out to people who have financial power. They start reaching out to people who have religious power. And they actually become so successful at peddling their pyramid scheme that they get Jennifer Aniston allegedly and Gerard Butler allegedly to come to like a course and take a course. And then they're, then they're telling everybody that they took a course. Luckily, Jennifer Aniston and Gerard Butler, if they did actually go like uh, Keith claims they did, they clearly uh, weren't impressed or saw some red flags right out of the gate because they did not take any more courses after that. It is at this point in the story that Keith and Nancy get their big break. In 2002, they managed to land the two female heirs to Seagram's gin, this massive billion dollar fortune. They get them to join and once they drink the Kool-Aid, they're all in. They're the Kool-Aid man busting through walls. They invest over $150 million, almost immediately. Almost immediately, they start going on air, talking about how great it is, what an incredible experience it is, how great it is for young professionals and they're pushing it everywhere. Their dad, mind you, is still alive at this point. He's not having any of this. He sees this and alarm bells are going off in his head immediately where he's like, whoa, nope, nope. I don't like this group at all. People who are in the 1%, they're especially primed to fall victim to cult mentalities, actually. Not only are they living this incredibly unrelatable lifestyle, so they feel socially isolated, even if they do have a lot of friends, but again, there's this false sense of like, I'm better than everybody, so therefore I would never be dumb enough to be tricked into following something that wasn't real. This happens a lot. There, there's like a whole pipeline for like rich people falling for cults, 
it, it's it's truly like a reoccurring thing it happens all the time and cults aim for rich people as well because they need money they need people to tithe for the cult so that this cult can keep going the cult does not exist outside of the scope of capitalism but more than that when you're a cult leader there has to be a certain level of self-awareness that one may have to pay a lot of legal fees at some point and having a giant billion dollar piggy bank in your back pocket is incredibly beneficial in the event that that happens, which it almost certainly will. As further evidence to the fact that cult leaders tend to know that, that they're doing something super wrong and illegal and like they're fully aware of it, they're not just like delusional as they may seem, is that in a lot of cults, the cult leader will very early on, especially if it's a religious cult, which Nexium isn't really, although like the weather control thing is like a little weird, but a lot of times, especially in religious cults where they're like, I'm the second coming, I'm the Messiah, They'll be like, if I ever get arrested and they ever say that I'm a P word or an R word or a this or a that or a cult leader, just know it's a test from God. I'm mentally prepared for it and we just have to make it through that time together. They're gonna be saying a lot of bad things about me. It might even be really compelling. You might want to turn your back on me so that you don't end up in prison, but then you'll just be showing yourself as a Judas to me. So they do have a certain a degree of awareness a lot of the time and they plan accordingly is, is all I'm trying to say. But the Brothman sisters, their dad, he's been a billionaire like for a while now. He knows the game. He understands that people like this prey on people like him and his family. And so he goes out through Forbes no less and he says, yeah, my daughters are in a cult. It's called Nexium. I have nothing to do with it. I don't want them to have anything to do with it, but they're adults, so I can't control them. I've told them how I feel about it. I'm telling you guys how I feel about it. I want everybody to be aware that there's a dangerous cult that is preying on people. My daughters are a part of it. If my daughters are part of the allure for you where you think it's legitimizing this program, just know it's not. I don't know why they're in this cult still. I've made it clear what my stance is. They, they don't care. So he makes it very known that like he's aware of what's happening and he doesn't like it. Obviously, his daughters stop talking to him after this. They're like, dad, you just embarrassed me in front of the global's cage. Uh. He's like, you embarrassed yourself. Uh. But no, actually though, they, it, it's a PR nightmare for Nexium, and uh, it almost destroys Nexium actually. So the Brockman sisters, they're not just gonna take this line down. They're like, we're highly successful. Dad doesn't know. He's just a boomer. He doesn't get it. So they start reaching out to the Dalai Lama. These are billionaire girls. They've got a crazy network of people at their disposal. They're like, if we can just get the, the Dalai Lama to come to some of these courses, it'll it'll be the best co-signing possible. I mean, like, you can't beat the Dalai Lama. So if we just get him to come, it'll just totally overtake the things our father has said and it'll just re-legitimize Nexium. So they start reaching out to this one monk who's basically like in charge of the Dalai Lama's scheduling and all of his stuff. He's sort of like his executive assistant, but he is still a celibate monk as well. And Sarah specifically, she starts banging the monk, the monk who's supposed to be celibate, who handles all of the Dalai Lama's affairs. Um, you know, no judgment, but obviously the Dalai Lama ends up coming to Nexium because of this. And uh, he is, he has no idea, really, the, the, the fact that he is just being paraded around as a tool for this cult, basically. They take a million photos, they take a million videos, they're shoving it down the media's throat. Anywhere and everywhere, every outlet is covering this because they're like, we have to make sure that when people look up Nexium, they see the Dalai Lama is there rather than seeing our dad's disparaging commentary. After this, Nexium is just on the up and up. Keith starts putting even more pressure on the high ranking members like, yo, we gotta have more stuff like that happening. We gotta have more celebrities involved in this. At this point, Alison Mack is, is just so busy as like a full-time employee of Nexium that her acting career is really coming to a close. She finishes up with Smallville, you know, they write her out of the script as she requested. She does a few episodes of Wolford and then she actually does a cameo as her last, her final acting role. She does a cameo in a show about a cult 
irony, you know, it, it, it's everywhere. So now that Allison's schedule is way more free, Keith creates this thing inside of Nexium, sort of like a Russian nesting doll situation of cult, 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 cult. cult. And it's called Jeness, J-N-E-S-S. -S. And it's basically like, specifically for women. It's, it's branded as this like awesome feminist thing, this pro women in the workplace thing. We're going to build up confidence. Oh, you're in entertainment. Let's build up your confidence going into auditions. Let's build up your confidence in this and that. And Alison Mack is heavily involved in this female chapter. She's like, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's also the most rewarding thing I've ever done. She's doing interviews. She's talking about it. She's hyping it up and it's bringing in a lot of people. But even though Allison was a full-time employee and a high ranking member, she was going broke. She had to continue taking the courses just like everybody else, because again, it's a pyramid scheme as well as a cult. So even though from Smallville, she made like millions and millions of dollars, it got to a point where like, she had basically spent all of that on Nexium and what they were paying her, like 90% of what they were paying her was going back into Nexium. And then at a certain point, they weren't paying her at all. So there's these emails that came out later in court of Allison Mack and Keith Ranieri, where she's emailing him like, hey, sorry, I don't wanna be a bother, but you guys haven't paid me in like two years and I'm having a really hard time paying my rent. So please like, I didn't want to be annoying about it, but I am supposed to be on salary. So if you could help me, that'd be great. <laughs> it's at this point that Keith starts championing Allison Mack. And he's like, dude, you know what? I know you've been doing great with Janess, but I think you should start your own chapter within that even. Within the women's only chapter, you should start your own chapter. It'll be a huge honor. It'll be awesome. And you know what? Everyone that you bring in for that, that'll supplement what we're paying you and you know we'll make sure that your rent gets covered this faction of nexium would end up being nexium's downfall it is by far the most extreme branch of nexium and of course not a coincidence at all that it's exclusively made up of women dos stands for dominus obsequious sororium which loosely translates to dominance over slave women and that's, that's, it said, that's exactly what it is actually. Yeah, they, 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 they named it accurately. At this point in our timeline, it's about 2015, 2016. So Allison Mack has been involved in Nexium for like a decade at this point. And the way that DOS is being branded within Nexium is they're telling all of the women Hey, Allison Mack, she's in charge of DOS. Keith is not involved with DOS. She's in charge of DOS. Keith just runs Nexium. And this is like a part of Nexium, but it's kind of its own thing. So like this is her passion project. That was not true. Keith was still running DOS. He just instructed Allison Mack to lie to the women about that, which is odd. I, I actually still don't fully understand the purpose of that beyond just making it look like it's exclusively run by women for women, but she still had to report to Keith over everything. And they, they created the entire structure of DOS together. And what's extra insane about the way that Allison and Keith went about this is they saved, and I don't know if this is a part of the collateral or not, but they saved all of these audio messages and emails of them explicitly describing their plans for DOS. And it's clear, at least on Keith's part, that he understands that this is criminal activity. And I'll get into more details of that in a moment. A lot of people, when they hear about the way that DOS function, wonder like, how was this so effective? Because it truly is so extreme. Nexium was already pretty extreme, especially with how much money people were having to pour into it. But DOS is on another level of mental, physical, emotional, and torture. Basically within DOS, they employed a similar tactic to a lot of other cults and also within abusive relationships, just 1v1 relationships. You see this a lot of the times too. It's just kind of a narcissistic tactic. They used sleep deprivation and they underfed the women and they had excuses for why they were doing this. Of course, they branded it like this was you know, a privilege to get to be a part of this program. Essentially, Keith forced himself into a nocturnal state. He would sleep all day and then he would be awake the entire night. Meanwhile, the women were put on this 
extreme schedule where they would have to wake up at 3 a.m. and then they would work the entire day until 1 a.m. and only then were they allowed to go to sleep. And during the day they were doing like intense domestic and manual labor. They were doing all Keith's chores and crap like that. And then when they were finally allowed to sleep for again only two hours mind you, Keith would randomly wake some of them up and take them on these long weird walks that was supposed to be like a privilege that you were chosen. So some people got no sleep at all. They were robbed of those last two hours. And by the way, the women weren't even allowed to sleep without asking permission from their master. And for most people, Allison was their master because she was the highest ranking member of DOS, at least to their knowledge, but there was still a tier system within it. So every time that they wanted to do anything, they had to ask permission from their master. When it came to food, the women were only allowed to eat a maximum of 500 calories. Keith said that he employed such like a, a high caloric restriction because, the, and this is disgusting, all of it is, but, because he felt that any body fat on a woman limited his attraction and all of the women in DOS were required to sleep with Keith. Keith is a convicted P word. So my theory about this is that he just was trying to force these grown women to be so thin that they were as small as possible and in every way that he could make them resemble a child, they would. It's disgusting. So this has the added bonus for Keith of them looking somewhat prepubescent as well as them being just so, so underfed and, and so sleep deprived that their minds are just putty at that point. That, that is the easiest state to manipulate somebody in. There's a reason that when people are tortured for information, they are intentionally deprived of sleep and food because it just makes you so much more malleable. And again, this is also a really common tactic seen in abusive relationships where like, if your boyfriend or girlfriend knows that you gotta wake up for 5 a.m. for work and you gotta work at 12, sometimes they'll pick a fight with you right at midnight. And so that way you don't get to go to sleep until like 3.30 and then the cycle just repeats over and over and over again until you get to this place of being so exhausted that you're just totally compliant, totally submissive. Whenever the women wanted to eat, they also had to ask permission from their masters and they had to also include the calorie count of whatever they were gonna eat. So even if they weren't with their master at the time, they would have to text them like, hey, I wanna eat an orange, it's 60 calories, is that okay? And sometimes they would be like, no and they just had to deal. And these women were at a point where they were just so indoctrinated, so heavily brainwashed that like they would listen even if they were incredibly hungry and literally starving to death. It's just in, an incredibly sad situation. And again, this is another reason that like, I really want you guys to be conscious of how you comment on people who find themselves being indoctrinated into cults because these people are so heavily victimized. Like these women are, are serious victims and they're already dealing with this like new school you're only a victim if you decide you're a victim thing. So then if you're already victim blaming yourself when you get out of this cult and you're going through heavy therapy and you've been incredibly traumatized, you likely have complex PTSD and stuff, and then people are commenting things like, God, I would never find myself in that situation. You have to be such an idiot. You're echoing things that they're already thinking about themselves. And we don't really need to amplify these negative thoughts. It is at this point that Allison Mack makes an incredible effort to indoctrinate one woman in particular, that woman being India Oxenberg. India Oxenberg is a actual royal and she's also a part of Hollywood dynasty as well. Her mother Catherine was an incredibly famous actress and her grandparents are literal monarchs. So Keith was really heavily pushing Alison Mack to get her to join because having someone like that who has that kind of colonial, political, and economic power would be invaluable. What's really sad about this specific case is India's mother, Catherine, she had a friend who recommended it to her. That's how they found out about it. And India just happened to be at the house at that time. So Catherine would have gone without her if India wasn't there. And India was only 19 at this time. India had just decided that college wasn't for her and she was trying to get out there and be like enterprising and start her own business. She wanted to have a catering company. And it's just so sad because when she heard her mom's friend talking about this, 
she was like, you know what? I actually might need that for my business enterprises that I'm working on. And her mom was just like, oh my God, my 19 year old wants to spend extra time with me. Of course I'm gonna do that. Yeah, let's, let's go to this week long course together in Malibu. And when they went, you know, Catherine, she wasn't really drinking the Kool-Aid, but her daughter was so into it that she didn't want to discourage this potential bonding experience that they could have together. So for a while, Catherine stayed involved, but then it came to a point where like, there were so many red flags that she was like, India, this is a cult. Like this, this is not a safe place for us. But at that point, India was unfortunately way too far gone. And just hearing her mother talk about it, like this poor woman, she just has so much guilt about the whole thing. But honestly, Catherine, if you're watching this, you seem like a wonderful mother and a great lady and you're doing incredible work and you did ultimately get your daughter back at the end of it all. So I think that you should be very proud of yourself. And I think India should be very proud of herself for surviving something so incredibly extreme. What's really important about India's involvement is Nexium saw her as their golden goose, but really India would ultimately be Nexium's downfall. The thing is India was Allison's slave and it's just so disgusting that people actually have slaves in this modern day and age, but the human trafficking, is, it's alive and well. There's more, there's more slaves right now, alive right now, than in any other time in history, which is just an incredibly depressing statistic. And this kind of situation, this is part of that. So India was Allison's slave. Allison and Keith came up with this idea that if you were in DOS and you got to a certain point, you would be branded. There's an incredibly chilling audio message of them planning this out together that I'll play for you in a moment that is just so, just so disturbing, just, just really so disturbing that I just can't believe the cavalier way that they're discussing this, but they decided that they would brand members of DOS and they got to a certain level. And unbeknownst to the members who were literally enslaved at this point, the brand was Keith's initials mixed with Allison's initials. And so from one angle looking at it, you would see Keith's initials and from another, you would see Allison's. And it was like seven lines that they would do. And instead of using an actual brand, which would have been brutal, but at least like one quick thing, um, they used a cauterizing device. So it ended up being this 30 minute long experience and they ritualized it where they would whisper something for each of the seven lines in their their victim's ear and then they would have to repeat it out loud so it'd be something like this is just like a made-up example but be something like i'm so happy to get branded and then they would be like i'm so happy to get branded and of course they're videotaping all of this because it's it's just a disgusting example of war i guess but Keith and Allison, uh, what's the date? The 10th. No, the 9th. January 9th, 6.59 a.m. talking about branding on the wall. I think doing the actual brand in an orderly fashion, mm -hmm. each of the seven strokes, <clears throat> having a certain ritualization, mm -hmm. <clears throat> maybe each of the strokes has uh, something that's said with them. Mm -hmm and maybe repeat it after the stroke is done. So like <clears throat> if somebody says the thing while the stroke is being done and then the person that's getting it done repeats it afterwards? Well, I don't know, yeah, you, you guys come up with something close to me. Okay. Well, because you've done it, so what would have been most meaningful, deep, surrendering, focusing for you? I think it, probably having it whispered in my ear and then me repeating it out loud. Uh-huh. And then having it whispered in my ear and then me repeating it out loud. Well, ask the others. It's not all you. Uh-huh. Well, I thought you were asking <laughs> me. No, I said all of you guys who've gone through it. Yes, okay. The other thing is, you guys did it and you weren't completely nude because you had a outsider and a guy doing it or whatever do you think a person who's being branded should be completely nude and sort of held to the table like a sort of almost like a sacrifice i don't know if that that's a feeling of submission mm -hmm. so it also of course videoing it and videoing it uh from different angles or whatever gives collateral it probably should be a more vulnerable position type of a thing 
back, legs slightly for legs spread straight, like being feet being held to the side of the table, hands probably above the head being held, almost like tied down, like a sacrificial whatever. And the person should ask to be branded. Okay. Should say, please brand me, it would be an honor or something like that. And an honor I want to wear for the rest of my life. I don't know. Okay. And they should probably say that before they're held down. So it doesn't seem like they're being coerced. Okay. I don't know, those are just thoughts. Okay. Sarah Edmondson was a member of DOS and she also believed that she was Allison Mack's best friend. And she was branded as well. As time went on, she sort of woke up to the reality of her situation. And despite the fact that they had all of this collateral information on her and her family and her kids, she decided that it was her moral duty to blow the whistle. And thank God she did. She contacted the New York Times and she told them exactly what was happening and she showed them her brand. But not only that, she got Mark and Bonnie Vincente, who were also members, to back her up. Bonnie was actually in Star Wars and her husband Mark was a pretty successful filmmaker. When they figured out that this symbol wasn't like some like spiritual talisman or like this great thing, but in fact just their initials, they knew that they had to blow the whistle on this entire situation. And the fact that the three of them came out together and all verified the facts, it was incredibly compelling. And when the New York Times expose hit, Keith immediately fled to Mexico. He fled to Mexico because one of the members, this was actually the son of the former Mexican president, so he felt that he would have a lot of political protection there, that they're not gonna extradite him if they catch him. The FBI immediately put out a warrant for him. They also put out a warrant for his emails. And again, Keith kept all of the evidence of his crimes for some reason. I don't know if they were trophies to him or what, but he kept all of it. And despite the fact that Keith was the smartest man in the world and could control the weather, he got caught after two months in Mexico because one of his other members, a woman who was actually married to Allison Mack, they, uh, I don't actually know what Allison's like sexuality status is, but they were apparently married because her wife needed a green card because she was Canadian and Mac was American, so that, that was the purpose of that. But her wife, Nikki Klein, who was actually in Battlestar Galactica, by the way, she just couldn't stay off the gram, in essence. She posted that she was in like a super sick 10K a night resort in Mexico and the FBI, was obviously monitoring her and everybody else who had moved and fled to Mexico. And so they saw the pics and they were like, oh, let's go there. So they went and they found Keith hiding in a closet since he can control the weather. I don't know why he didn't just create a hurricane to uh, take out the FBI's PJ, but you know, let's not judge Keith. For some reason, Nikki Klein was like so confident that this arrest was bullshit that she like, filmed his arrest. Like, Nikki, you're, you being chronically online is the reason he got arrested in the first place. Put the phone down, you know? I mean, it's a good thing that she didn't because we got him, but still, it's just like, come on. Common sense isn't so common, I guess. And to this day, by the way, Nikki Klein still stands by Keith. She's like, Keith did nothing wrong. She's one of very few people from Nexium who believes that still though. So Keith is immediately arrested, but Allison Mack isn't arrested right away. Keith? He's getting caught on near everything. And at first Allison's like, no, like we're not guilty. Like this is just an organization to help people. We're doing good work. We're not a cult, like geez. And by the way, like the courses that Nexium had, they even had a course on how they're not a cult. Like I'm telling you, there's an, aware there's, there's an awareness. They try and circumvent these things in advance. Anyway, so then, like I said, India would end up being the thing that really takes this whole thing down. India is still, still Allison Mack's slave at this point, at this point in time. Allison finally gets arrested. And while she's arrested, she calls India and she's like, hey, I need you to take all of my stuff to a storage unit. So India is still indoctrinated heavily at this point. So she's like, okay, I will. So she's taking all of her stuff. And then while she's doing that, she starts like actually looking at the stuff that she's moving. She realizes that this is all of the collateral for all members. So she's got all of this valuable information in her hands that could free all of these people, including herself. 
she also finds all of the audio and video messages of Keith and Allison conspiring, like criminally conspiring to commit crimes and openly discussing how best to go about it so if they get caught, it doesn't look as bad. So at that moment, India's bubble is immediately popped. So she hands all of this over to the federal government. She finally goes back to her family who is very happy to have her back. And at this point, Allison Mack's like, shh. Okay, I gotta change strategies. So now she switches her plea from not guilty to guilty. And she starts talking. She throws Keith under the bus. She's telling everything. She complies as much as possible because her attorneys are telling her, dude, you, Keith? is gonna get a life sentence. You could still get a life sentence because you're Keith's right hand man. You have to do something. So her attorney's defense was that she was also groomed and she was also a victim of Keith and she wouldn't have done any of this if it wasn't for Keith indoctrinating her. I believe that that is true. I really do think that's true, especially based on personal testimonies from her friends and family. However, just because we understand how we got from A to B, and we can see why things panned out the way that they did, and we can understand why things are happening, that doesn't then mean that we can excuse the things that have happened. You know what I'm saying? So just because we know that she is a victim of Keith, that doesn't suddenly not make her a perpetrator of her own crimes. It doesn't stop her from being a predator in the way that she was. It is sad, we can feel bad for her, it might make it so that she doesn't get the same sentence as Keith, but she is still somebody who committed atrocities against other women and she literally enslaved people and she literally branded them with her initials and she literally physically and emotionally abused people and she literally human trafficked people. So though we can understand that she probably wouldn't have done any of that if it wasn't for Keith, doesn't make those things go away. But this defense ends up being pretty effective and Allison is given just three years in prison, three years probation, she has to do a thousand hours of community service and she has to pay a fine of $20,000. Now, I would like to conclude with this clip of some of her former coworkers from Smallville because I think it's very telling the way that they're talking about her personality changes over the decade that she was involved with Nexium. And I think Allison Mack is a really strong cautionary tale. And I think the way these people who knew her talk about the change in her demeanor is like very telling. And it really goes to show just how much this cult mentality can poison your thinking, poison your judgment, poison your impulses, completely rearrange things that you think are normal and abnormal and things you do and don't want to do and just resets your entire moral compass. Were you close to doing it, you think? I was not. I mean, she invited me. It was that weekend. I just couldn't afford to do it. Do you it. think you could have gone through? Because when you watch the first episode, I, I've said this before on a podcast, I was like, I'm in. How did you feel? Uh, I think it was, I was just in denial with Tom. We were just like, nah, okay, yeah. I, I really didn't pay attention to it for a while until it was in everyone's face around the news. I mean, you and, knew her well, so. Well, I didn't know her well. I was on set with her. We did scenes together. I directed her. Um, she was always sweet. She was always, always knew her lines, always gave her 100%. Uh, it was a joy to work with. Um, you never think in a million years that that would happen. And you, can, you go back though, and you look back and you're like, huh, because it was obvious that she needed something. She needed something else. And I don't think it was what it ended up being. I think she just thought, I need some, I want to be loved. I want to be in a group that I feel comfortable yeah, with. She didn't go into I want to be knowing. the best I can be. She didn't go in knowing, of course mm -hmm. not. So you can't alter for that. It is, it's still hard for me to believe. I mean, there was an incident at my house. But years later, but I think it was after Smallville, she, you know, she's in the vicinity, she comes out of the house. She walks in and she walked in. She was a different person. She walked in like she owned my house. Like literally, she owned my home. She walked in with her friends and they walked into the kitchen. I was like, hey, she was like, hey, how are you? And then walked into my kitchen, started bringing out pots and pans and started cooking. I go, uh, what are you guys doing? My friend Ethan's like, she's like, we're hungry. We're hungry. 
we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, I remember that like it was yesterday. I, it, it, I gotta talk to Ethan because then I said, after a while, I just felt uncomfortable. I was like, well, hey guys, you know, uh, like that's it, come on, you know, let's, you know, let's, and I kind of asked them like, hey, you know, you might wanna leave soon. And I was gonna be nice. The guy turned almost violent, I mean, he was violent. Like he, who is it? I can't remember who it was, his name. I don't, cause I didn't care. I just was like, who the f is this guy? Very angry and like, just, I think he was on something. And he was like, and he just started kind of cursing at me and Ethan. I was like, f you. I'm like, oh, you know what, buddy? I don't know what this is about. You just come in, you start cooking in my house. You guys don't even say that. Why don't you guys just go? Why well, I'd actually like you to get the f out of my house. That's what I said. And I remember I was waiting for Allison to sort of jump in and say, I'm so sorry. No, 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 he doesn't mean this. I'm, there was nothing. It was just like, it was almost like there were zombies. That's how I remember. I'll never forget it. And I'm not saying that the, 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 this has anything to do with it, next thing has anything to do with it. But when they left, I looked at Ethan and we were, hearts were racing and I'm like, oh my God, I'm disgusted. All right, that is it for today's video. Thank you guys so much for joining me for our first Spooky Saturday. I'm excited for Spooky Saturdays because things like this, they're of a lot of interest to me. I really like, I, I really find it fascinating, like fringe social behavior times that people are just like super divergent socially and like social structures that happen within cults and things like this. I think it's just really interesting. I also think it's good to learn about because it helps people prevent themselves from falling victim to these kind of things when they know the hallmarks of these groups. So I'm glad that we're doing Spooky Saturdays because it gives me an opportunity to talk about stuff like this, basically. Hey buddy, like oh a boy, I want you, you want to say bye to everyone? Yeah, hey, what a handsome little boy. What a handsome little boy. You're so cute. I just wanted to say goodbye from Dante. He's left in the background the whole time. Even when he wasn't in the back frame over there, he was just over there. Over here, I've got all of my socials. If you want to interact with me on those, that'd be sad. I appreciate that. Um, and don't forget to turn on alerts, like, and subscribe. I just redid all my playlists, so I've got good descriptions on all of them now. So you can know what kind of content to look out for, and you can see if there's anything that appeals to you. But I'm excited. I'm going to start uploading really regularly. Uh, so I'm going to be doing this every Saturday. And I'm also going to be starting to do Mukbang Mondays, though I'm not starting this Monday. I'm going to start next Monday. So I'm excited for that too.